You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hello, everyone. In this video, we look at Einstein's field equations in vacuum. In particular, we will show that in the limit of weak gravity and small speeds, compared to the speed of light, Einstein's field equations in vacuum reduce to Newton's theory of gravitation in vacuum. Let's begin by writing down Newton's theory of gravitation. X here is the position of a particle whose motion is influenced by the gravitational potential phi. The solution to these equations will depend on the mass and shape of the object that generates the gravitational potential. For a spherical object, the solution is particularly simple due to its rotational symmetry. To obtain the gravitational potential inside the object, the right-hand side of this equation must be replaced by 4 pi g rho, where g is the universal gravitational constant, and rho the local mass density. However, today we will only focus on the gravitational field in vacuum. In a flat spacetime, in the absence of any external forces, the trajectory of a particle will always be a straight line. For instance, if a particle starts out with zero velocity, its trajectory will be a vertical line. If the initial velocity is non-zero, its trajectory might look like this. In both cases, the particle moves along the shortest possible trajectory in spacetime. The square length of a small segment on this trajectory is given by this expression, where tau refers to the time as measured in a particle's frame. It is called a proper time. We saw in an earlier video that the shortest distance a particle travels along an arbitrary surface is the solution to the geodesic equation. In the absence of curvature, the Christoffel symbol in Cartesian coordinates is zero, and the equation reduces to this, which is nothing but an equation for a straight line. Now, in order to make the particle's geodesic a curve, the geometry of spacetime must be given some curvature. In other words, the square distance of a small segment of spacetime must have this form, where Gij is the metric tensor, and the Riemannian curvature tensor derived in an earlier video must be non-zero. Notice that the two sums start at zero. That's because conventionally the four spacetime coordinates are labeled like this, where x0 refers to ct, and the rest of the coordinates are the familiar x, y, and z. Now that we have an alternative theory for why particles move along curved trajectories, let's compare it to Newton's theory. In Newton's theory, what causes acceleration is the gravitational potential, which satisfies the Laplace equation. In Einstein's theory, the acceleration is caused by the curvature of spacetime. But what is the curvature of spacetime? To answer this question took Einstein seven years. At one point he had the right answer, but an error in one of his calculations made him dismiss it, and it took him a while to realize he had the right answer all along. Ok, so what is the right answer? We already know that without mass there is no gravity, and hence no curvature of spacetime. So we need an equation where on one side we have some measure of curvature, and on the other we have mass. Since mass and energy are the same thing, this side must also include energy and perhaps some other things. It is tempting to write the Riemann curvature tensor here, but we already know that this will not work, because we need the curvature tensor to be non-zero in vacuum. Also, since we are looking for one equation for every component of Gij, we need an object here with two indices, not four. The number of such objects is limited. We could try the Ricci tensor, which has two indices, or this object, which consists of the Ricci scalar and the metric. Note that setting the Ricci tensor to zero automatically renders the Ricci scalar zero. The left-hand side could also be a combination of the two. There's simply no way of knowing beforehand. The only thing we can do is to take a guess and see what happens. Let's try this equation and see where it leads us. The first thing we want to see is whether this equation, together with the geodesic equation, reduces to Newton's theory of gravitation in the limit of small velocities compared to the speed of light and weak fields. What I mean by weak field is that the metric is close to the flat spacetime metric. To make our lives a little easier, let us also assume that the field is not changing with time. 
In the small velocity limit, the spatial part of these four equations reduces to this. All other terms in these three equations are of order v over c and v over c squared. That means we only need to concern ourselves with these Christoffel symbols. Recall the dependence of the Christoffel symbol on the metric. The gamma 1, 0, 0 will look like this. Since our metric is independent of time, these two terms will drop out. The inverse of the metric looks like this. And this term is just the derivative of h. So, up to the lowest order on h, the Christoffel symbol looks like this. The other two components can be obtained via the same procedure. In fact, if you go through all of the components of the Christoffel symbol, you'll find that to the lowest order, they all go as a derivative of h. Now we must solve this equation in the same limit. We can immediately drop the last two terms, because they go as dh squared. Since we are only interested in the gammas with lower indices of zero, we only need to solve this equation. The time derivative is again zero, so finally we end up with this equation. Combining it with the three components of the geodesic equation, we very nearly recover Newton's theory of gravitation. If it wasn't for these two objects, the two theories would be spot on. But we're not done yet, because to the lowest order on h, d tau is in fact equal to dt. To see this, we can write out the space-time distance. Dividing both sides by c squared dt squared, and remembering the low velocity limit, we end up with this. Inserting these back into the geodesic equation, we see that the term 1 plus h0,0 cancels out. So finally, we end up with these sets of equations, which match Newton's equations perfectly. So, it seems that the vanishing of the Ricci tensor is a good candidate for the correct theory of gravitation. This simple looking equation is called Einstein's field equation in vacuum. However, correct behavior of a theory and a particular set of limits does not prove the theory's validity, only that it is plausible. In order to demonstrate that the theory is valid, it must be capable of new predictions. In the next video, we will look at a couple of such predictions by solving this equation exactly.